Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another chapter of Experiencer Interviews. And today we have another amazing story coming to us from the US. We have Debs Shakti on board. Debs Shakti lovingly hosts a long standing local CE5 contact and consciousness group and is an active member of several international C5 contact teams, researching the infinite nature of consciousness. She is the associate producer of the new top rated film, Alien Abduction Answers. Her work as a quantum hypnotherapist who worked with John Yost, the filmmaker, as well as with all of the experiencers in the film is highly featured. Also featured in the film and is with Lee Strieber, author of Communion and many other best-selling books on ET contact, and the broader topic for consciousness. Debs has many decades of professional service of working with such people and many others, seeking self-discovery and clarity about the nature of consciousness. She was born with most of what she affectionately calls her superpowers switched on, what others may call the psi gifts. She also cherishes a lifetime of daily, almost constant contact with the various forms of consciousness, including ETs, interdimensionals, orbs, celestials, ultra terrestrials, and more. She has always perceived and been able to live slash work multidimensionally. She channels the ultra wise group entity known as the star teachers, as well as other highly advanced beings who say they are us, having evolved to a much higher, more positive and co-creative frequency. She works with all types of energy healing modalities and is a 50 plus year yogi and yoga breathwork meditation mantra teacher. She is a lifelong competitive athlete and is a former national champion martial artist, published author, and much more. Deb Shakti loves everyone, our planet, and everything that makes up life. She's doing her best to work her purpose slash dharma to assist as many as possible to become consciously balanced and sustained in a self-awareness, most of all to be and share and teach love. So before we get into the interview, I'd like to share with everyone two trailers regarding this amazing documentary. So enjoy. I was able to perceive things from a more global perspective. I felt nothing intimidating from any of these experiences. So I didn't have fear. For me, fear is a human response to danger, and I never felt in any danger. This is not communication. It's communion. Hundreds of thousands of people have claimed contact. That will change you. It changed me. Last year. This was something that I kept buried for years. Strange things would happen. I didn't want anything to do with it anymore. He came at me and I fought for my life. Ships started to pop up in the sky. And there's this bizarre disc of light. It is moving across the sky very fast. The experience is often very terrifying. If I felt fear, I would crawl under my covers, hoping that it would go away, whatever it was. I know that we were put in that craft. I knew I was going to go to another planet. And the being was right next to my face. He saw two shadow beings. That's when I felt like I was going to die. I had a real encounter with something. Even if I had to live with the fear, is to know the truth, is to know.
So Debs, uh, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me, Jan. I really love it. Thanks. Thank I'm, I'm so excited to talk to you. Jan, now, I too. <laughs> <laughs> did your uh, experiences start off as a kid? I, I'm really interested in mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I mean, people ask me that all the time. And really, the earliest experience I have of contact, I was probably two and a half, three years old. Um, I was uh, in my, my little bed. Uh, I lived in a, a cute little house in California where I was born. And I was grateful my, my one wall next to my bed was completely glass, like floor to ceiling glass. And uh, I just heard a little tap, tap, tap on the window. Uh, from the tree outside, my favorite tree. I just love this tree. And uh, there were little creatures in the tree uh, with big eyes. And they telepathically were saying, come out and play with us. It was the middle of the night, come out and play with us. And I was so excited to have little friends. And so I got out of bed, ran to my parents' room and woke my mom up. Poor thing, she, by that time she'd had another child and was pregnant with the third one, I think. So she was pretty tired. But she said, oh, you're dreaming, honey. Let's go back to bed. Put me to bed. Kiss me goodnight. And, you know, five, ten minutes go by and tap, tap, tap again. And they were asking me, please come outside. Please come outside. And so I, you know, went and asked permission again. And she was a little more irritated at that time. Put me back to bed. This happened three or four times. And by the last time she was, she was fed up. And so she got really stern and she put me in bed. She said, look. Uh, oh, I called them space monkeys. Now, this is significant because I didn't know anything about space yet. My parents didn't talk about a lot of stuff like that. They were pretty mainstream people. And I don't think I had ever seen monkeys before. I hadn't, I know I hadn't been to the zoo yet. Maybe I'd seen pictures of monkeys in the encyclopedias we had, but I don't know. But I put the two together and I said, the space monkeys want me to come outside and play. And she said, look, I don't ever want to hear about those space monkeys again. Never talk about them again. And if you don't go to sleep right now, you're going to get a spanking, which, you know, terrified me. So I didn't ever talk about them again. Uh, but that was my first real, I mean, that has stayed with me so clear. I can still see them. And of course, now I realize they were, they were probably great. Based. But that was how my little, that was my little screen memory, you know, from being a little baby. But I remember them clear as day. And, uh, and I've had lifetime contact ever since with many different beings, as you said in the intro. So, Do you remember how tall they were? Could you describe? Yeah. And that's, that's what's interesting, too. Throughout my life, I've especially seen the greys. And they're never more than three or four feet tall. But they, as I grew, as I started growing, up they started growing up in size too it's almost like a reflection of me so as this little child and I'm a pretty tiny person anyway but as a little child I was very tiny they were probably maybe two feet tall they were my size and they were very um they were delicate okay really cute <laughs> so you would see them through the window is that it yeah yeah okay yeah they didn't come into my room they were as far as I know, they didn't come into my room that time. But after that, it was no holds bar, you know. <laughs> so. oh, funny. Now, did you like, did that give you like a, a sense of fear? You, did, or did you feel anything from them? No, I didn't. And, you know, like you said in the intro, I was kind of born with all of that stuff turned on already, including the fact that we are multidimensional beings, infinite dimensional beings. So, you know, I always have experienced other layers of reality overlapping my own, this reality. So even at that age, I already had very close ties to another family who looked human, by the way, but the they all were different than my own family, than my human family. Um, they all had histories. They had big, long stories. And you know, I interacted with them a lot. They were just my family and my fam, my hum human family. I always just thought I was a real imaginative child and real creative, you know, and just kind of slopped it off as, oh, she's telling another story. But, you know, um, I would tell my father what my other father had done at work that day and, you know, how he was dressed and what my other mother was baking for dinner and, 
you know, I think in that family, we had seven children and my human family, we had four, but because I had these deep relationships with other families like that, not all of them were human. There was a mantis family too. Um, and I didn't know about praying mantises till I was probably a teenager because where we lived, I never saw them. So, which is interesting, but because they were, came across this family, which they are, um, none of these beings have ever scared me, even as a child, it, it, you know, sometimes they might startle you, like you're walking in the bathroom and there's somebody standing there and, you know, but after the initial shock, just like, Hey, what's going on? Yeah. You know, did they, but how did they appear to you in a sort of energy form, ghost form? Everything you can imagine. I mean, I have, uh, in fact, I've done a lot of paranormal work that doesn't have anything to do with what one would call extraterrestrials, uh, working with spirit forms, shadow people, uh, ghosts. Um, I've even worked with what some people thought were demons, wanting them to be taken out of their house or, you know, exercised or whatever. And really, they're all just other versions of ourselves doing other things. And when you can go in there and not be afraid of your own self, and I think that's the key, because many of us are afraid of kind of the darkness or the weirdness inside ourselves. We don't like to see it out here in our own reality. But when you can get really comfortable with who you are, then it's you're more comfortable with who they are, you know, and, and yeah. So it's our, it's our feeling state too, that is reflected back to us often, you know, uh, they just want to communicate. They just want to have relationships, most of them. And, and that is the first law of universal communication. Mirror your, mirror your, uh, uh, the person you want to communicate with so that you can understand each other. So if I'm acting all scared and everything, they're going to act weird too, you know, like, ugh or which sounds like, or feels like something scary often, but I've never, I, I can't ever remember a time when I was terrified of anything like that. So. so what you're really telling us is that you sort of remember past lives in a sense. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't call them past lives because there well, is no past or future. I just call them alternate realities or uh, quantum realities, you know, life, life realities. They're just other lives. But yeah, I remember them very clearly. And, um, and part of the work I do as a quantum hypnotherapist is help other people tap into those because they're very informative and they're very helpful in overcoming our fears and in healing traumas and, and just really unlocking that wonderful Pandora's box of who we really are, which is you know, the vastness of the universe, basically, the cosmic mind. That's who we are. So growing up after that, uh, you know, the fact that the, uh, you know, the, the, the grays were outside, uh, what happened uh, in the relationship with your parents? Because how did uh, you and your family ever like worked it out? Because um, when I had my own experiences, my I would go to my mother and tell her. So I'm just wondering how you and uh, mm -hmm. your family and all that progressed. Yeah, well, um, respectfully. I don't talk a lot about my family and these things because I respect their privacy and everything, but my parents have both passed on and, um, and I communicate with them a lot and they're both okay with me saying this, but uh, really when I, especially when I was a child and this kept getting more and more, um, you know, of a constant thing. Uh, and I love talking about it. Um, they just, it's really kind of their scream memory way of doing things, you know, that it was kind of a dissonance where they're just like, she's just really creative, but I would be told, you know, you don't talk about this in school. Don't talk about it to your grandma. She, it might be scary to her, whatever. Um, and then as I went to school and realized the reality of my reality, um, you know, I went to Catholic school and it was very strict and, and, uh, you know, I got sent home really early on for asking, you know, what I thought were really interesting questions, but or telling really interesting stories. I realized, you know, um, there are, there's a time and a place for everything and not everybody's ready. Not everybody's having the same experience I am. And, you know, I was probably six years old when I had that realization. 
And so um, started kind of, I don't want to say it, molding what I did in public uh, to match what was going on instead of, you know, just yeah. being all, ah, let me tell you about this. Plus, I was a very introverted, shy child anyway. I, I would not have gone into, you know, like a classroom and said, hey, guess what happened to me last night? And then it was reinforced, of course, by my parents because, you know, after the first time of being sent home from school, um, I, they were very strict about saying, you know, you just, children are supposed to be seen and not heard, listen to sister and, you know, answer questions when you're asked, but, you know, school is school. I think it's a matter of respect for the place and the pace where people are on, on the path. We're all on the path, but everybody's walking at their own pace and in their own manner and in their own sense of timing. And so, you know, you don't talk to most kindergartners about trigonometry, for instance, right? Number one, they're probably not interested. Number two, they don't have the foundational understanding, most of them, although some children coming in right now do, but most of them don't have that foundational basis of understanding. So it, it might even irritate or, or cause them fear. Like, what is this person jabbering about stuff that I don't understand? You know, it puts them off. So one of the things I've learned from the teachers and, and these other beings who are, you know, my very close friends and family is that just like them, they're not supposed to interfere in our path. They can assist, they can guide, uh, but we are not to interfere on other people's paths. You know, as much as I would like to just shake everybody and say, look at what's happening, you know, that's not their reality. They're in a slightly different frequency than I am. So it's not relatable. It, it's not even the timing's wrong for them. It's, it's actually deconstructive. So um, to, to continue a bit what we talked about earlier, uh, what happened to you uh, growing up? Did, uh, can you get into other experiences that you might have uh, as a kid or maybe in your teens? Yeah, well, um, you know, there's a little snippet in the movie where this is going into family, but my brother and I, we had moved to Georgia by that time. My dad was first in the Air Force and then in, uh, worked for the Justice Department, but he, uh, we worked uh, or we moved to Georgia from California, which was so blissful because we lived on the edge of this uh, Air Force town where there was like 60 miles of pine forest. Whereas, you know, I was living in near LA in California, which was, you know, we had a little postage stamp backyard. So my brother and I, I think I was nine years eight, we would go out to the woods and we had this beautiful uh, kind of cleared space. We made a fort, you know, how kids do. And it was our special place to play. Smelled so good because it was pine forest. And I am, and, uh, he woke me up one night and said, the woods is on fire. We need to go out there. Now, eight and nine years old, number one, you don't usually go out of the house by yourself. We would have never done that, but it was like, there was no question. We had to go out there and why children would think they should go near a big forest fire. I don't know. So it, the whole thing doesn't make a lot of sense, but we did. We snuck out of the house, ran out to the woods in our little summer clothes. It was summer. And we saw this huge glow. And by the time we got to, and it was right there at our place, we got there and seriously, Yannick, the thing that was above us was this huge mothership, beautiful, millions of lights, sounds. Uh, it was like music, but no engine sound. And uh, the other thing I don't mention usually, but I have to mention today, is that when we got there, all of the pine needles and the branches and the stuff on the, on the floor of the forest were hovering like this. It was remarkable, pine cones and so forth. And I, I really remember that clearly. But um, for decades, I didn't remember anything else. You know, the next thing I know we were, uh, it was Saturday or Sunday morning he was shaking me again in my bed and he's like that 
uh, we can't tell in anybody about what happened last night because we're going to get in trouble for leaving the house. So you have to promise me, you know, we made a blood brother pact or something. We can't talk about this, but our, and I was like, was that a, you know, what, what was that? But I looked over and our clothes were kind of over on the floor and they were muddy. Our shoes were muddy. And he said, but we need to go out there and see what that was. So we went out to play. We didn't say anything to mom or dad went out there to play and where that had been in our, in our meadow that we had made was a huge burnt out circle. It was still kind of smoldering. And uh, yeah, so that was interesting. Um, I've only tried to talk to him and we never did talk about it again, but I tried to talk to him once. Uh, I don't know. 20 years ago, we were at a family party. Everybody was talking about reminiscences and things. And I said something to him about it. And he just laughed and said, Oh, we both just had the same dream. That wasn't real. And, and laughed it off. And I could tell by that time, I knew when people didn't want to talk about stuff, you just don't. Um, and I think one other time I tried to ask him about it and he got kind of annoyed and said, no, we both just had the same dream. Just let it go. So, um, so I honor that because sometimes people aren't ready to remember, but uh, it did happen. And then eventually I did go through my own regression and dug in there and got a lot more. And indeed we were, you know, we went up into this craft, or at least maybe that's the screen memory too. Who knows? I think you go into an interdimensional space, but we went to what Whitley Streeper calls a secret school many times. It won just once. And, uh, you know, I can remember that at that point, I was only nine, but, and also reinforced by the fact that I was by a forest. I saw wildlife for the first time. I just love, my heart was just in it. From that moment on, I became an eco-activist, very, very into taking care of the planet and wanting to live off the grid and everything. At nine years old, it was unheard of back then. This was the early 60s. And uh, I think, you know, in the secret school, that was the message that we kept getting is you're killing our planet and we need to, you know, you're being educated on how to take care of it. So, so that was a very, very important experience in my childhood. And I'll tell you this, it was, that, I think that was like 1964, 65, something like that. It was like 12 or 13 years later that Close Encounters of the Third Kind came out. The movie, I went to see the movie, which was fantastic. But that at the end, that big mothership comes up on screen and I was, I was knocked cold. I thought, how did Steven Spielberg see the same thing I saw when I was a kid? And it has really racked me ever since. It's the same ship. So. Amazing. Crazy, you know? So- were you under the ship or were the ship was the ship in front of you it, we were under it it was it. huge it was it was huge i mean I, I i'd say bigger than a football field at least huge so you know and i've had people tell me you know when i tell this story well you were near an air force base and that air force base is very close to a huge hot spot of ufos you know, uh, sightings and so forth. And you're, and, and, you know, my dad was, I, he may have been involved in other things. Um, that's something for another time, but, uh, so it was probably air force. It was something air force that you saw. Maybe it was a test, uh, vessel aircraft or something. But if we had that kind of technology at that time, kudos to us is all I can say. Did you have a missing time? What happened between you being under the ship and you being in bed? Yeah. I mean, that was, I mean, I, I'm sure it was probably 11 o'clock PM or more later when we went out and it was morning when we got, when we woke up, there was, that was definitely missing time. And I think that was my first experience of missing time. Um, I've had a lot of missing time and a lot of what I call compressed time uh, or flexible time in my life where like, I can remember, uh, a few years back, I even recorded this to one of my CE five groups, uh, in a recording, I left work, uh, at my usual time 
And at the time, my commute was about an hour and 15 minutes long because there was lots of construction between my house and my office. And I use that time to talk to clients and, you know, catch up on phone calls and everything. And I can remember people saying, oh, and I was answering voicemails. So I was leaving voicemails back. I couldn't get hold of anybody. And I remember people texting me saying, there's nothing coming over in your voicemail, but gibberish, but weird sounds. And can you just call me? And I would just go on and do the next one instead of calling the person. Anyway, I got to my house, to my driveway, and someone called and said, look, whatever it is you're trying to say, it's not coming over. Can we just talk? And, but they said, but it, can we hurry? Cause it's dinner time. And I thought, well, that's weird. Cause they live on the West coast. It's not dinner time for them yet. And I looked at the clock and it was, it was, or excuse me, Eastern time. They're on the East coast. And I looked at the clock and it was literally 10 minutes before time for me to leave from work. And I got to my house. I, you know, I normally would not have left work and I would never leave work early. I just am not that kind of person, but it was 10 minutes before time for me to leave work when I got to my driveway. And so I went back and looked at the voicemails because I couldn't figure out what that was. And it was, it was making all kinds of little beep boop weird sounds, but the times were earlier in the afternoon. And yeah, so it was very weird distorted time there. And I, you know, here's the funny thing. I was becoming a little bitchy about the construction delay in my commute. It had been going on for a year and I was just tired that day. And I said, you know what? I wish I could just have a helicopter and pick me up and take me home. It would be five minutes and I wouldn't have to waste all this time. I literally think the beings gave me that experience that day. I hear you. Just to be funny. I don't know. Or yeah. to say, stop being so bitchy. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, now you talked about the mantids earlier. Did some, did, did that actually happen physically? The, the, uh... Yes. Yes, physically, and in what you would call kind of those dream type experiences. But, uh, you know, as a child, um, there were those beings who came into my room or outside and playing. It didn't just happen at night. And uh, they seemed to like the outdoors better. So, but they weren't green. They were blue. They're blue. So I don't know if anybody else has ever seen those blue mantis people, but, um, and there was one who is, uh, he's quite common comes into often comes into my deep meditations and his face is just like right here. This, this very intense blue looks just like a praying mantis face, but gentle as all get out. And they usually show up when I'm critically ill, I've had some critical illnesses and uh, some devastating injuries over my life. I'm a pretty extreme person. I'm either extremely well or I, I'm almost dead. You know, it's so weird. But uh, I've had a couple of those things happen. But they always show up when I need healing. Like even as a child, I remember having whooping cough really bad. And, you know, my parents thought it was just a fever dream. But I said, there's a there's a blue praying mantis here and it's, it's little scratchy hands or, you know, trying to calm me down when I was coughing so much and one put its hands on my chest. And I think my dad just said, Oh honey, it's the fever, you know, go back to sleep or whatever. But they usually come around when healing's needed. So I interviewed uh, Ron. Um, he, I think he was on a ship and uh, he had, I'm not sure if it was a hernia, but he had like lower back pain, uh, really mm -hmm. bad. And he had this um, mantid, I think, behind him that put his hand through his back and worked on his back for a while. And it was really painful. But when he finished, the back pain uh, went away. Wow. So there's a lot of stories about mantids that do heal, uh, heal us. Uh, could, did you get a sort of idea of how tall this mantid was? Yeah, they're usually really tall. They weren't like the little gray people who 
matched my size. They've always been really tall for me. Uh, of course, everything's really tall for me. I'm just five feet tall, but you know, the, um, they look just like a giant form of praying mantis only they are for me, they're blue. Um, probably, you know, six, seven, eight feet tall sometimes. Yeah. Was this uh, mantid wearing anything other no. than, no, he was totally blue. Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. There's one time that the one who comes into my meditation sometimes has a thing on its chest, like a necklace, uh... kind of like a necklace, kind of like a crystal. Uh, I don't think it has anything attached to it. It's just a, like a crystal form. Um, and it's some sort of sacred geometry. It's, it's a definitely a geometric form, but it's just right here on its chest. And I don't know if that is part of its um, way of coming closer. Like maybe it's a good way to bring our frequencies together or something. It might be like a kind of a, a step down transformer or something, you know, for the energy. That's what I get. It's it's not part of the healing process. It's more of a uh, bringing us into coherence, I guess, frequency wise. But that's the only time I've ever seen the mantids that I encounter with any other thing other than their own form. I've heard uh, of uh, greys having blue eyes. I've heard of. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I interviewed uh, this guy. Uh, he uh, he had a blue avian guide. And uh, this was way before Corey Good. Mm -hmm. So this is this is him growing up telling me the story about a Navy guide, mm -hmm. and uh, and you've, we've got blue uniforms that tend to pop up a lot of the time. Yeah. So, but yeah, this is the first for a mantid. Um, yeah, the color blue is usually associated with the throat chakra, which is communication. So it doesn't it 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 doesn't uh, surprise me that the blue color comes up when you. Know, really what we're trying to do is have communication or communion so interesting did um did you ever wake up to seeing sort of uh, medical devices i'm not because you know, sometimes people do wake up on craft but, yeah uh, yeah i mean most of them are they're just um you know that's a fun question because i've i've never really gone into that and thought about why wasn't i afraid of that you know you wake up you know, I was in the hospital a couple of times when I was a kid and as an adult several times. And some of that's equipment in there is kind of terrifying. But uh, yeah, now that I think about it, there's equipment. I mean, sometimes it's in my room. Most of the time it's in the other spaces where I am, where I go with them, what you would call craft or the interdimensional space or maybe taken to another uh, planet or frequency or whatever and in that space um there is physical stuff happening so that material you know there are like i can remember a and this is a terrible depiction but you know it you see my hand here but think about my hand being the fingers of my hand being like four feet long and really spindly and then with you know kind of uh pneumatic or whatever joints with points on the end and they would come around like on a boom like on a boom arm and come over the face almost like a cage and I thought well that's interesting I think it was kind of sensors or something kind of like we would put on an EKG hat you know with the little sensors all over the cap for people I think I interviewed someone that had something similar interesting yeah that's cool. I can't remember who but it, it, it was a, she was a female. I'd have to get I think back. He, I think you might be the first person I ever told that to. Really? Just because Thank it's you. just, you know, it's like, I don't know why everything is just so matter of fact for me. It's like, it's not terrifying, but, um, but I do remember that very clearly. And it was, it seemed mechanical, although much more fluid than our mechanics are um, for the most part, you know. Um, I will say a lot of the craft and the, the, what you would call physical spaces that I have been to with them are um, some of them are very fascinating. There was, I was doing a, a star teacher uh, channeling broadcast a few years back 
where we were, you know, and I, I just channel, we get on zoom with people from all over the world and I channel and they come on and they interact with the teachers, but either before or after that interaction, they do a process to give upgrades and, and to do healing and stuff. And that process, we were literally all taken up into uh, a craft, you know, which is interesting now that we're thinking about it because there were people from all over the world on this Zoom and everybody was taken up to the same craft at the same time. But it was, um, it was cool because it was transparent. You could see it was like it wasn't there. Like you could see the rest of the universe. You could see the earth below under the floor, but it was literally a craft. And I remember sitting on a kind of a curved crystal uh, seat and the machinery and appliances in that craft were all crystal. Everything was crystal. Wow. And, but it was really cool because they were showing me how some of it worked and, um, you know, while I was channeling, that's what I'm doing, walking around this craft and looking at all of it. And going, wow, this is amazing. And, you know, going up into the craft, it looked again, probably the size of, of a large house or something like that. But you get in there and it's as large as a city and it held all these people. And um, which is incredible. I've had that experience a lot where you go into something small and it's huge, but uh you know, I don't remember usually when I'm channeling. So um, afterwards, there was a kind of a sharing time and everybody was like, oh my gosh, that craft that we all went in and, you know, everybody had the same experience, but uh, their experience all was slightly different than mine. That's cool. So I always record everything I do because I don't remember it. And then um, I go back and listen to it. I'm like, that's exactly what I experienced. So. Are you aware if you ever took part in the hybrid program? Pretty sure I did. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I did. I was just going to mention when you said, uh, you know, some people see the the uh, little grays with the blue eyes sometimes. I've seen some of those, and I'm pretty sure those are hybrid children. Um, I don't know if they're my children or if I was just being shown those children, but they were definitely children. And they all had the blue eyes. They were big eyes, but they were sweet. And, um, you know, they're kind of shy. And, um, yeah, so I don't know. I, I really don't know. I have friends who definitely are in the hybrid program. And I have friends and clients who we discover in the quantum hypnosis sessions who are hybrids themselves. And they didn't know it. And it makes so much sense because some, they have these unique qualities that no one can explain, or they have a unique something going on with their body that no one can explain. And, uh, and that comes out and we're like, whoa, cool. And there are way more on the planet than one would think right that now. The part is that a lot of them do have like female problems because of it yes. later on. Yeah. 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 And you know, it is what it is. I mean, we're working with, <clears throat> I like to call the bo this body, the human body is your spacesuit because that's what it is. You're in a spacesuit so you can walk around in this environment, right? And be effective, just like astronauts, uh, astronauts wear in space. But the unfortunate thing is this spacesuit, as miraculous as it seems, is a pretty rudimentary piece of biotechnology. And you can only push it so far so fast and sometimes the parts you know wear out or they don't work well after they've been used that way it's like you know you don't run your car at 130 miles an hour for any length of time your regular car because it's going to ruin the in engine right so i think that's what happens to some of these women but i also know for sure that we all make these contracts and volunteer for these encounters and these experiences long before we come in here. And so it is, um, it's an experience that subconsciously most women don't remember until they do go into the, um, into the quantum to look at that, into the field. 
but once they do, and even if they do have those uh, problems or they, or they have that deep sense of longing, I have a male client who has just feels devastated because he is separated from his hybrid son. And he only gets to see him, you know, every so often. And it's just, he just, his heart hurts because of it. But we keep telling him, you know, this is all part of the kind of the experience that you two decided to have together. And, you know, somehow it resolves. It, it always does. But in this lifetime, it part of what you decided to come in here and experience was that deep longing. And, some, and sometimes it's painful. I had an experience uh, several years back where I was almost disabled from uh, what we thought was an inner ear or a brain malfunction. Um, I, I went on a trip, I was on an airplane and when I, when the plane landed, I couldn't hear and I had all this pressure and we were on vacation and it lasted the whole vacation. I thought I was going crazy. My balance started getting bad. And, um, when I returned and I couldn't hear, and when I returned, I went to, uh, an ENT who said, Oh, you've got Meniere's disease or something. And but he didn't really check and he just spent five minutes with me. And he's like, quit eating salt and drinking so much coffee and alcohol. And I don't do any of them. You know, I didn't do any of them at the time. And, and so uh, it got worse and worse. I got to where I, uh, I had all kinds of weird things, even though I couldn't hear loud sound, especially bass uh, in music would affect my body like bombs going off. I couldn't, stand light. I couldn't stand it. I was super sensitive and I couldn't drive. I couldn't get around. It was awful. I went to a balance Institute to try to figure it out. They finally sent me home one day and said, we've done everything we can do. We're going to refer you to a brain surgeon. Um, but in the meantime, you might want to get your affairs in order. We think something's really wrong. And, um, but the whole time I was going through this and this lasted for like four months. Um, the teachers kept saying, stop being afraid of this. This is your body is trying to recalibrate itself to the level that your energy field is now from all of your practices. You're so high up here that your body's back here and it's lagging behind and we're trying to help, but you're not helping much by doing all this other stuff. You're getting in the way. Stop being afraid that something's wrong and just allow it to uh, catch up. And, uh, I remember going home that day and crying because of what that doctor said. And the other thing was I was really tired all the time. I just slept all the time. I went to bed. I slept for like 12 hours. And when I woke up, I didn't even think about it. I jumped out of bed, got my clothes on without thinking going, Oh my gosh, I couldn't even turn my head without fainting before because the balance was so bad got out of bed. And then I realized, oh, I can hear perfectly, but not just perfectly. I can hear the tectonic plates and the earth moving. I can hear the grass growing outside. I can hear people talking a mile away. What is this? And uh, my senses were very acute and they came in and said, well, you finally let yourself rest enough so that the work can be done. You're upgraded. The body is now able to handle this new amount of energy. And you know, you never were sick. You, there never was anything wrong with you. You just, your body couldn't handle that much energy. We had to upgrade the systems. You had to upgrade your systems. And, you know, after that, I started getting people, just a plethora of people who were going through the same thing. And that was the answer there. You could go to the doctor and none of them would have an answer. So, you know, I've never had a healing though, that that would have been awesome. That was awesome. That's one of the most awesome things that's ever happened to me. So. So when did the teachers come in? You know, they've always been here, but I didn't know who they were. I just, you know, I've always had guidance and, um, and I learned early on to listen to the voices in my head and do what they say. <laughs> this sounds super insane. And I'm sure I'm going to be put away one of these days for saying it, but, um, I've always had deep guidance, you know, turn left here when you usually turn right and you just learn you do that or else, you know, you're going to get hit by a bus. But, uh, I don't know. It's been 
now probably eight, 10 years ago, I, uh, I had a physical office where I saw people locally and I was in a healing uh, session. I was doing energy work and channeling for this person who did not believe in anything at all, um, was a um, terminal cancer patient, literally had, they'd done everything, like two years worth of stuff, uh, everything they could throw at it medically. And she was just dying. And they sent her home to, to die, basically. And one of her relatives was a student of mine, and she bought her a gift certificate for to come in and do an energy work session with me. And she just thought, what do I have to lose? You know, I'm dying anyway, and I don't want to leave my favorite aunt, you know, mad at me for not appreciating her gift. So she came in, but she told me, she's like, I don't believe in any of this stuff. So let's just get to it. She was on my table. Um, you know, I had, had her on a massage table, didn't do massage, she was doing energy work. And while I was in the session, which was very profound already, I was connecting with her, literally the ceiling of the office just disappeared and there was a huge craft above the office. And I was standing at the head of the bed at her head and there were, uh, I think it was five, five of these beings, seven and a half, eight feet tall, look like dark glass or clear chrome if that sounds weird but transparent chrome long thin bodies uh, a kind of a pointy head no facial features but you could see kind of into them and there would be like these beautiful streams of light or galaxy looking things colors I've never seen before going through them and they said we're here to help and um they literally did they started downloading into me all of these different modalities that I didn't know. One of them actually came around, stood behind me and literally put their hand, put their, like inserted their arms and hands into mine. If you can imagine that almost like I'm a puppet, like a hand puppet and started manipulating my hands and giving me visuals in here of what to do with the energy. It was fantastic. And they were all doing stuff with her. And then suddenly they just kind of evaporated. The ceiling came back. Everything was back. And um, so at the end of the session, I always have them sit up and give them a drink of blessed water and, you know, energy affected water and, and debrief. And I said, so how do you feel? And she just looked at me with these like steely eyes, like she said, I'm perfect. And I said, Oh, you feel good then. And she said, no, you don't understand. I'm perfect. There is nothing wrong with me. And then she proceeded to tell me what she experienced, which was the same thing I experienced word for word. And she said, those people were the most beautiful people I've ever seen. And I don't believe in any of this, but now what do I do with this? And I said, I guess you say, thank you. <laughs> and she was so grateful. And, um, Later that month, she called me and she said, I went for my next appointment and they did all the tests and I don't have cancer. She was completely healed. So that was pretty gobsmacking and, but not unusual. I mean, I've had miraculous stuff happen. You know, you hear about it, but I was grateful too. And, um, but ever since that day, they have been right here, like in my meditation, in my office, in my sessions always talking to me, always giving me information. And they were very insistent. And they said, now you have to start holding uh, gatherings where there are more people so that we can interact with more people than just you. So I did. And people were just loved it. They would come in and start asking questions and they would get answers like on any subject, just amazing technical stuff even. But people were starting to say, hey, who are we talking? We want to know how to address them. And so I asked and they said, we're you having evolved to a different frequency. We're all of you. Uh, and we've evolved past the dualistic karmic nature of third dimensional earth life. We're an ET entity, group entity, but we all have individual 
gifts. Uh, we work together closely, but we've also evolved past the egoic need for a label. So we don't have a name. And <laughs> like, well, people are pretty insistent. And they said, you know, they were kind of a little put off, but they said, tell them they can call us the star teachers or the teachers, whatever feels good to them. So that's where that name came from. But ever since then, they have been, we've been constant companions. They eventually told me that I, they've been with me all my life. Well, just always, but that, um, and they are amazing. You know, I, I host these large gatherings. Now we do them over zoom or TikTok live or whatever, YouTube live. And, um, seriously, people can ask anything and they will present answers that I don't have. You know, I'm a pretty educated person, but I don't know a lot about many things and uh, they'll give answers and uh, it's amazing. So, so that's who they are. Beautiful. Well, it's quite understandable that the need of having a name is somewhat not important when you're a telepathic uh, or yeah. energetic. Uh, yeah. Did, um, have you ever seen other UFOs up close? Other than that? Oh, the, the... oh yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lots. I mean, I see them all the time in our CE5s, both, you know, individual and with groups. When we do groups, uh, we've had some spectacular sightings. And thank goodness I work with a lot of people who are, you know, pretty high level in, in that community. Uh, who've worked with Greer and and uh, other people who are, you know, really high, highly up there and highly esteemed. And so some of them are videographers and so forth. We have great video footage of some of the things that we've seen. And, you know, I, part of me, you know, there's, there's this part of me that really wants to get a really great, you know, camera like they have and all that. So I can document too. But for the most part, you know, even when I do have camera equipment with me or audio equipment, I'm just so in awe of what's happening and so enjoying what's happening. I don't even think to use it, but yeah, I have at times and I've captured some good things, even with my little iPhone five back in the day, you know, but for me, it's the direct experience that is so meaningful. Um, and I've seen craft of all kinds. You, we've seen orbs, uh, Central, you know, we call them craft. I've seen non-local consciousness in many forms when we do CE fives, and I call it CE five. That's kind of like calling a cotton swab a, a, a Q-tip, you know. Uh, basically, in these experiences, these close encounters, um, we could have ground activity with all of these little lights showing up, little chirping beings, uh, people coming and sitting on your lap tweaking your cheek like this. I've had that happen. Um, definitely have had temperature changes uh, inside the circle. We had a CE5 a few years back. I think it was 2019 in the summer where uh, it was kind of bad weather. And so the first half, it was gray and rainy and drizzly and a lot of people left. And, but I could feel them. And so after our little break, the people who stayed, the, the core people who stayed, who was really devoted, we went underneath, we were at a park, we went underneath a park shelter, you know, with a big tin roof and the wooden beams. And we were the only ones there. And we uh, became very coherent. We did some practices to bring us very coherent in our hearts. And suddenly, and it was summer, so you hear all these frogs and locusts and crickets and everything all these sounds outside and the rain and suddenly we realized we don't hear anything we could still see outside the shelter but we didn't hear anything what was that all about and suddenly we realized we're not in the either we're we've been taken up into a craft or we're in a different dimensional frequency we're still here you know it still looks like here but we're not here and um, we were just, you know, playing around with the physics of it. It was really cool. And at one point a park ranger came and drove up, saw our, our cars. We could still see our cars out there, but we couldn't hear or see anything um, inside other than our voices and outside. But this park ranger drove up and shined his lights right at the shelter, got out, looked at the cars with his flashlight, didn't see anybody. 
and then drove off. And we realized the guy didn't see us in there. Like we weren't there. It was almost like we were in a dome of some of energy. And um, so eventually it, it, we realized we were hearing the crickets and frogs and stuff again, and it was over, but over two hours had passed and it seemed like it was like 10 minutes. So they're again, missing time. But uh, we literally went into a different dimension. Um, and I've had that happen a couple of other times when I was with one of our international groups out in California. We up in the high desert in the mountains and uh, we literally had craft come up out of the ground and surround us. And there was a healing that happened to one of the participants that night. Um, and uh, that, so that was really phenomenal too. But how did the craft, what did it look like? How did it? That one was cool. It was kind of like, you know what a geodesic form is? Um, have you ever seen a geodesic dome? You know, a dome home that looks like a half of a buckyball. Yeah, yeah. It looked like that, but it was kind of a, a glowing orange, like a light orange color. And it just literally came up out of the ground and surrounded me and uh I think it was two other guys, maybe three guys on the team. And, um, and there was stuff happening. There was a healing happening to the one fellow. And then there were, we were getting downloads and, uh, wow. and there was kind of a light hum in that thing too. And it was pulsing. There was a pulse to it. And uh, one of the members who was in there with us was um, uh, one of the people who've been with um, Dr. Stephen Greer for about 30 years. He's, you know, one of his right hand guys and he's very knowledgeable. And he said, Oh yeah, these craft come up out of the ground, out of the inner earth all the time. Uh, but people just don't think of them that way because they're always looking up in the sky, but yeah, that was definitely quite an experience. And he corroborated a lot of what was happening. So uh, that was really cool. Impressive. Um, so let's talk about the services you offer. Uh, you do talk about oh, it on your website. Yeah. Well, um, we've mentioned it, a couple of them. Quantum hypnosis is a, it's a very unique form of hypnotherapy where um, I have people, I give them some homework before they come into the session. Uh, it's some breath work. It's some sound technology. It's stuff to get their, uh, the crystals in their body all coherent so that they can engage the pineal gland and go into the quantum field better and, and retract the information they need. Um, and then, you know, I use a very special uh, technique to get them guided into that. Uh, they go to what you would call past lives or future lives, or even into this life, looking at things because everything is recorded in the field. There's nothing ever lost. All of this information always exists. So we could tap into it anytime. And once we can see it clearly, you know, healing and uh, discovery and uh, all kinds of things, questions are answered. And it's just, it's a beautiful technology. Um, so I do offer that. And then uh, the channeling, you know, I channel the star teachers or whoever needs to come through. Again, I think it's all a version of the person asking for the channeling. I mean, if I were to channel for you, I would tell you right off the bat, this is you talking to yourself in the form that you need to hear it from because people are, human beings are outward referring. They, they like a permission slip. They don't trust what they hear in their own heads, most of them, yeah. other than me. <laughs> um, so the star teacher channeling also is something that I offer and I love to do. And what's unique about all of these services is the energy work now. It's not a separate thing. I mean, people can come to me just for energy work, and that's fine if that's all they want. But any of my services come with accompanying energy work. And it, it is probably the most profound part that happens in these sessions. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and then, you know, there's some other stuff that I do. Um, I do paranormal stuff for people, um, energy clearing and stuff in homes and businesses and things like that. But teach yoga, you know, hold workshops, do speaking engagements, you name it. Cool. You want something, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm able to do it, I'm game. So. 
Let's talk about your involvement with uh, John Yost and the, uh, the new documentary that came out. So how did that whole process came into be for you? Oh my gosh, that was, you know, serendipity. Uh, you know, years ago, I asked the universe to just use me. You know, I didn't know, you know, you're always seeking for what is my purpose and everything. And, and I do all these things, you know, and at the same time, I was maintaining a corporate presence. I'm a wife, I'm a mom and grandma, you know, all of these things. I said, just use me however you can, and uh, I'll do my very best. And I learned early on from the yoga and the martial arts that you can get into a state of flow uh, if you are consistent in your practice, right? And when you're in a flow state, the universe just kind of falls in place for you and gives you what you need. So, or it always does, but it's easier this way. So... I never in my wildest dreams three or four years ago would have thought I'd be in a movie ever, but um, the universe is serendipitous and uh, it brought us together by way of a friend who was talking, got us together talking about another project, some other form of project. And I met John in a meeting and I kept getting messages from him that he needed assistance and I usually don't look at people's energy field or read, you know, I'm telepathic. I don't go in and read people's minds all the time for fun that I have to have permission. I have some ethics to me. So, but he was broadcasting me that he was suffering. And so, but the conversation we were having, one would never know. And he's this big, burly, cheerful guy, you know, funny guy. So after the meeting, um, that was all well and good, but the teachers kept saying, you have to contact him and, and offer him a session. Tell him, you know, just tell him, you know, and I'm like, this guy doesn't know me from Adam. I don't want him to think I'm some nut bag. You know, all I have is an email address. And, but they just kept insisting and I kept resisting, which I never do. And finally I woke up one morning and about three days later and I said, okay, okay. I, I give. And I emailed him and I said, look, I just felt you. Um, I felt that you have something that you need to work on and that you're afraid of and maybe I can help. And so I'm offering you a gift, you know, take it or leave it. No obs, you know, just, just, you know, your free will, but uh, here it is. And, you know, put my phone number and everything. And right away he called me and he said, how did you know? And it was just, you know, I think he was really scared, but he just was suffering so much from a trauma that he had when he was a child um, that he was ready to, he was like that lady. He was just ready to do whatever, you know? So that's how we met. And so he was, he was terrified of everything, but he was especially terrified to do the quantum hypnosis for that particular experience. So it took another year and a half, about 18 months of doing little bitty other things that he kind of like training wheels. And one day he called me, he said, I think I'm ready to do the big one, Debs, which he called that experience, the big one. I'm ready to look at it. And I'm like, cool, let's set up a Zoom because it was right in the middle of the lockdown for the pandemic. So let's set up a Zoom and we'll get going. And he's like, no, nah, I don't, he's like, it, I'm a filmmaker. It needs to be, you know, I want to do this on film. I want to do it real and raw. And I think the world could be helped if we document it. And I really, I, again, I had some resistance. I'm like, I've never done that before other than recording the zooms, you know, or, or before that, just recording in the room. Um, and how would that work? Number one, we can't travel. Number two, um, you know, you're wanting to use cameramen and audio people and all of this and lighting and all of that. How would you relax enough to, you know, I'm good, but I don't, I don't, I've never had that. And he's like, we'll make it work. Just consider it. And, you know, within weeks, the travel ban got lifted and um, we made our appointments and um, I traveled to their studio in Pittsburgh and they fixed it they actually recreated my office in a set. They had me take photographs of everything in my office and they recreated my office and uh, made it really cozy. And then um, 
they had the camera and lighting and audio equipment all in there and everybody uh, worked their stuff remotely from other places in the studio. And we did the session. It was about six hours long and uh, got it all. And afterwards, you know, he'll, he'll be the first to tell you this. He didn't, he was afraid to look at it for a few days, which is really odd for a filmmaker. He's like wanting to, you know, he usually want to look at it right then, but he was kind of scared. And when he looked at it, I think he was in awe of what came out of his mouth because it was profound stuff. And he said, you know, and I told him, you know, I said, a lot of what you're talking about, I've heard a thousand times in my sessions from other experiencers, not the same variables, but the same feeling states and the, the same type of situation. And he said, do you think any of them would want to come on film and talk about their experiences? It's just like he got this idea. I said, I don't know. Let me see. So I queried um, some of my former clients and very few said yes, by the way. Most of them said thank you, but no. But the ones who said yes, um, those are the ones you see on the film. And we've become really close. We've become each other's chosen family, basically, because of this film. So it was all kind of, I believe it was all, it sounds so woo-woo or, you know, even religious, but it's not. I believe it was divinely ordained um, how that all happened. I really enjoyed it, by the way. The documentary Thank was was excellent. Uh, my girlfriend you. and I watched it. Uh, how it's presented, uh, the stories, John's stories, everyone's stories, and you know the how the, the you know the drawings, the animation, the oh, tempo, yeah. everything was, and the music, everything. I loved it. Thank you. Thank you. I you know we decided early on that this documentary is more than a film. It is. Um, it's kind of a download for people. It's an energy form. And so we were very conscious, all of us, everybody involved, super conscious at all times of where our energy was when we were doing any work with the film. Because basically when you watch that film, and now if you just hold that DVD in your hand, you're getting an energy download. And we wanted it to be as much in uh, in integrity as possible and of the highest form of love. It was a gift of love to the world. So thank you for the feedback because it's just, it was very important to us to present it in that way. And John and his crew, his film, the film company are outstanding people. Just, I mean, I've never worked with people of such high integrity and talent. The quality of the talent is just amazing. So Thank you. Thank you for that. So you met uh, Whitley Strieber too? Yeah. Again, who would have ever thunk it? Um, Whitley was a, a big part of my uh, life. You know, I, I, I went through this life like, you know, described to you earlier, but there was a good deal of time, you know, there um, in my young adult life where, um, I, you know, this wasn't part of the conversation. It wasn't a big deal or, or maybe you just didn't talk about it. I was, you know, in corporate life. And then I started, uh, you know, becoming a mom and I was very busy and all of that. But I can remember, uh, I think it was with my second child. Uh, I was in a bookstore looking for a book on potty training or something. And uh, this book fell off the top shelf. This is so stereotypical of that book fell off the top shelf. It was summer and it hit my foot I had a sandal on it hit my foot and hurt my foot hurt my big toe and I looked down I went oh my god I looked down and there's that iconic face looking up at me from the cover of communion that everybody knows you know the guitar pick alien face and I was shocked I'm like oh my gosh that's the face I've seen my whole life who is this? What is this? And of course I forgot about the potty training book and bought that book. And I went home and I read it in one sitting. Like I stayed up all night and read it. And I was just, I was like, Oh my gosh, I finally feel actually validated that someone else has had this experience only, you know, his experiences were a little more scary at first than mine, but I felt something from him. And I thought after reading, I thought, 
someday I hope I can meet this guy and say thank you. And as fate would have it, he got drawn into making the film with us by just serendipitous uh, connections. And, you know, John at, at the end of it, at, well, we were towards the end of the film and uh, filming it. And he was so pleased, but he said, you know, I, I would really like to have a real like known expert in this film just to give it some more validity. And I said, well, what are you thinking of? And he said, well, the one that comes to mind most is Whitley Streeper. John is a bigger bibliophile than I am, which is saying a lot. He probably has 3,000 3, books in his library. He had read all of Whitley's books as I had. And he said, I've always wanted to meet him. And I said, so have I. But, you know, good luck. The guy's really famous. And he's also kind of reclusive for many reasons. And I don't know, you know. And so we talked about it a little bit and I let it go. And one day, just right away in meditation, I got, you know, somebody who's good friends with him. Why don't you talk to him about making an introduction? And I did. And lo and behold, Whitley said yes. And he fell in love with John. He fell in love with him and said, absolutely, I'll be part of this film. I think it's important. Who would have known? And so we were, were literally, you know, tying up loose ends on the film. And he said, but I'm really busy. And I have, you know, this span between these three weeks, these next three weeks uh, where I'll be in California. And then I'm traveling for a lot of engagements and stuff. If you can make it happen in that period, then we'll do it. A friend who introduced us actually uh, invited us to come to his ranch. And we filmed out at the, at the ranch in Ojai, California. So we put it all together, John, I should say, not we, I was just invited to go along. They put it all together, got it all and made it all happen within like a week's time. And uh, we went out and filmed with him. And he has been a precious part of my life ever since. Um, there are a lot of stories I could tell about that, but I won't. Um, we've got not a whole lot of time, but I even now have a relationship with his transcended wife. <laughs> because of something that happened in the filming, you know, her, she made her photograph come alive. I'll just tell the story quickly. He was going over their life together because she was such an integral part of his life and, and the contact experience. And he was talking about how they met, how they married all of their experiences that happened while they were married and the deeply sad experience of her getting sick and passing away. They were so close that he now wears both wedding rings. Um, he just, you know, they're like one being. But he always uh, broadcasts with her photo in the background. Well, he brought her photo with him, as well as the original painting of the communion cover, which I thought was really cool, um, to be put on the set there uh, for his part of the filming. And so her photograph is really beautiful. It's this black and white photograph. And she's kind of looking off into the distance like this on a side view when he got to the part of the story and we were filming we'd been filming for hours but he got to this part where he's telling about her passing away and he broke down he's such a beautiful sensitive soul and I'm, I'm gonna go into tears if I say too much but uh he was facing John was in a chair asking him questions off camera and I was standing behind John kind of doing energy work for the whole thing. Cause I could tell it was going to be really brutal. And so he was facing both of us. We're facing him and he breaks down, starts to weep, like sobbing. Weeping. And the picture comes alive and she looks directly at me. She was looking off here in the picture. She looks directly at me, makes eye contact, then looks over here at him and goes, and laughs, and then the picture goes back the way it was. I thought, what? What just happened? What just happened? And so we cut film because he was really having a moment. And, you know, we wanted to let him, you know, reconnect and gave him a drink of water and, you know, patted his face dry. And I went over and I just hugged him really hard. And I just, he was just, you know, sobbing and I hugged him and I whispered in his ear 
I don't know if this is the right thing to tell you right now, but Ann's picture came alive just now. And he sat up and he said, what did she do? And I told him and he's like, that was Ann. That's exactly what she would have done when she was in the body. And, you know, she's done it a few times with other people already. And I have no doubt that really happened. And from then on, he was fine. But from then on, she has communicated with me off and on. She's really cool. She's like the fun, just the most fun person ever. So every once in a while, she'll give me some talking to or share some information with me. And I always just call and leave him a voicemail or send him a note and say, well, here's what Annie has to say today. And oh. it's just beautiful. But, you know, they've written several books together since she passed away. So anyway. Beautiful. Um, cool story. Yeah, it is. Uh, now, getting back to the upside down guitar pick that you were talking about. Yeah. You're the second person that when I would try to describe my face, it appeared to me in front of my, when, uh, upon waking one morning, and I was looking at that, I would call it uh, an upside down guitar pick. Yeah. And you're the second one to, to, that I've ever heard of actually say that. So it's really like amazing, it creepy, but it's, it's, it's so I've true. That, the, that's what it looks like with big eyes. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, coming back to um, Whitley's contribution, you have no idea how many people I've interviewed that would, didn't know anything about ETs, had their own experiences as a kid, would go into a bookshop and his book was there and the face would you know the then the everything would like come back to them and say oh my god that's that actually happened yeah it's like a light switch that face i literally held that painting by the way you know you look at that you know it's painting on the book i've always thought oh it's this big giant painting somewhere it's only about this big it's it's smaller Mm -hmm. than the cover of the book i literally got to hold it and i felt the same way I felt one time when someone allowed me in a museum to hold one of those ancient Russian icons, you know, with the peeling gilt frame and everything. That's what it felt like only, oh my gosh, just so much energy. So yeah, um, that face, again, it's like what I said about our film with the energy coming through to the viewer. I believe that image is a piece of technology to wake people up and have them start to remember no doubt about it as i think his books are so true um now you've, you've talked about shadow beings if you, i think once uh mm-hmm. how did they appear to you did was it something that happened during the night often during the night um although i have seen them in the especially when I, you know i do i'm i've been a runner all my life and a ultra runner and I, now I hike because I'm a little older. I still run sometimes, but I like to hike. I'm a nature girl. Uh, so when I see them in the daytime, often it's in the woods. But for the most part, in the in, indoors, it's usually at night. And it's usually when I'm asleep or going to sleep. And you see them out of first out of the peripheral vision, which is which makes sense because I always get it mixed up. I need to look this up and really write it down. It's either the rods or the cones of your eyes uh, for that affect your peripheral vision that enable that those are literally wired to the pineal gland through the optic nerve. Um, so they are, they're picking up on other frequencies than your straight ahead vision, your straight ahead vision up to peripheral is more about your physical surroundings and out here is more about your frequency surroundings. So that's why when we're trying to get people to like, for instance, in my classes, I have a school called the quantum dojo and teach people how to learn how to turn their, their superpowers back on. When we're trying to teach people about seeing, perceiving energy, for instance, I'll say, just relax your eyes and pretend you're looking out the side of your eyes towards the back and just stay relaxed. And we call it a soft gaze. And soon you're going to start to see a few things and they do. And often they will see shadow of things out here, but yeah, the shadow beings I've always seen um, for the most part in indoors are in peripheral vision first, and then they come into view. It's almost like a training of an in training of your vision to that uh, 
sphere. Sometimes they look like smoke or mist. Um, and in fact, um, one of our CE5 groups uh, that we held a, a big retreat up in Wisconsin, a training retreat a few years ago, uh, one of my friends uh, who was our, one of our photographers, videographers caught, we had a lot of activity that night and we could hear and feel a humming. And he caught on, I think it was on his IR uh, lens on one camera. And then with his night vision on another, caught an image of a huge wall of mist that was surrounding us. Like it was, you know, 20 feet tall and it was surrounding us. And yet with the naked eye, we now never saw anything. And we believe that was conscious as well. It may have been a craft, but it was conscious. So sometimes it looks like smoke, but often they do have kind of amorphous, kind of human forms you know but uh yeah the well mine were like six foot tall broad-shouldered football players with a huge round helmet like disproportionately huge yeah and sometimes they've got uh i've interviewed some that had the the the, the hat man shadow beam yeah also oh yeah you know what i get a lot of people not a lot but i've had a good number of people with the hat man okay so that's a common theme too i don't know but the but what you're describing the big shoulder the big burly kind yeah. of bulky looking guys that's yeah. usually what the shadow people look like to me okay when they're the people form now we've been this for a while now uh like do you have a like a, a sort of like closing comment or something that you might have want to re to tell to the uh, to those watching yeah you know what i think what i'd like to say to everyone is don't be afraid of anything. There is nothing to fear. And it's the same message the teachers give all the time. There is nothing to fear because there is no death. You are an immortal, unlimited, infinite being of vast potential. Um, and that what you see in your physical life is but a speck of what is your existence. Remember that your feeling state relates to what you what your reality is. So be conscious, work more to be conscious and just be the best you you can be. People ask me all the time, what's my, what's my purpose and all this. Be the best you you can be authentically and purely. And, you know, be aware that everything you do has, uh, I don't want to say consequence, but it does have an effect. So just work really hard at being playfully being the best you you can be and and that's the last message is have some fun with this this is an amusement part for the soul don't let it drag you down so much oh that's so beautiful so, yeah well thank you so much again for thank on. you and thank you also for your contribution in the documentary oh thank you so much it was my great pleasure and uh just hint hint there's more to come so <laughs> <laughs> there, there's too much to put in one little 90 minute movie so good so we have more up our sleeve thank so, you so much that's great so to those watching hope you enjoyed today's interview i'm your host mr great mario tv is coming up and i'll see you guys next time so thank you thank you everyone hello everyone this is mr great and thanks for watching today's episode if you are an abductee contactee or experiencer and you believe that your story could help others please feel free to contact me through my YouTube channel email. When it comes to experiencers, the ET phenomena, and the future, remember, truth will out.